Welcome to CS356, Designing the User Experience. This lesson on declarative programming is for computer science students, and I will be referencing in this lesson other materials covered earlier in the course. And this lesson will describe declarative programming and what it is and why it's useful to know. Um, declarative programming is uh, becoming a dominant paradigm for uh, programming different applications with user interfaces and so that's really why it's important to kind of cover this topic. Uh, there's really two main flavors of programming paradigms. Uh, there's many others as well but uh, declarative programming and imperative programming are both examples of programming paradigms and a paradigm is just like a model or a way of looking at something and it's helpful to understand declarative programming by contrast, contrasting it with imperative programming. So imperative programming is about writing code to directly control the state of a program. Uh, some people say that imperative programming is, that, is programming the how of how your program works. So each statement that you write when your program is telling the computer you know, how it needs to do things very explicitly. Okay? And when we say that uh, writing code to directly control the state of the program, uh, what we mean by state is uh, any variable or data objects that store values that really need to persist over time. So imperative programming is all about managing that state directly uh, by giving the computer very explicit instructions on how to do its job. Uh, imperative programming includes C, C++, and those sorts of uh, programming languages. Declarative programming, on the other hand, isn't about the how, but the what. So declarative programming is about writing code to tell a program how it should look and work, but the state is all kind of handled automatically. You just define what you want and some logic for how it works, and then everything else is kind of taken be, uh, care of for you. So as a programmer, you program what it should look like and some logic from how, for how your program should work, but the state is handled automatically for you. Okay. Just say what you want, the code figures out the rest. That's the basic idea. So that means that declarative programming is a higher level of abstraction compared to imperative programming. Imperative programming forces programmers to think in a way that is closer to how a computer thinks. Declarative programming is closer to how people think. So it tries to get rid of complexity by matching the way that people think. So let's take the metaphor of just driving a car. Imperative programming is more like manual. You have more control of when the gears shift, but you have to sort of understand how the car works in a little bit and how gears uh, shift. And the driver has to be more aware of that and give specific instructions to when the gears shift. That's kind of like imperative programming. Declarative programming, on the other hand, uh, is more like having an automatic car. It's just one less thing you have to worry about. The car just automatically changes the state of the system by shifting the gears, gears for the user. So that's kind of the, the basic metaphor that we're working with. So let's look at an example in code. So a while ago, re we reviewed the web framework Vue, V-U-E, and Vue is a declarative web framework. Uh, HTML is also declarative. You just declare what you want and it shows up in the browser. The state inside of our view data object uh, is right here and whenever that data changes our HTML will automatically change with it. So inside of the HTML we are referencing the state and that is just handled by our view object. So specifically, we are binding to the input element here so that when the, the input of this input element changes, it updates that state and that state will automatically update the HTML with it. 
and you don't need to do anything else to make the HTML change. It just kind of happens automatically. You just declare what you want, and it works. That's the basic idea. So uh, I, there's another definition of declarative programming that I like, and that is that it's the act of programming in languages that conform to the mental model of the developer rather than the operational model of the machine. So two lectures ago, remember that we talked about conceptual models, uh, aka mental models. And just to review, uh, the purpose of the mental model is to help the user bridge the gulf of execution and the gulf of evaluation evaluation and I recommend reviewing those concepts. So what declarative programming is trying to do is it's trying to create a simpler mental model for the programmer to help them understand and program faster. So if you're designing your own computer language and you want it to be very easy for the programmer then you would try to abstract away as much of the complexity as possible and use something like a declarative paradigm. So the key takeaway from this is that uh, these design principles that we've been discussing this semester don't just apply to user interfaces, but they're much more general principles that apply to designing all sorts of systems, including programming languages. So back to programming paradigms. Uh, here are some examples of languages and frameworks that are built with different programming paradigms. For example, you have uh, imperative languages such as C, C++, and Java. Uh, declarative languages include HTML and uh, SQL and uh, Dart, for example. And then you also have like frameworks and libraries like Flutter and SwiftUI, for example, and Vue. Uh, but you also have some languages that are kind of in the middle that use aspects of both. And these are just typically called multi-paradigm languages or frameworks, for example. Over on the imperative side, these have less abstraction from the operational model of the computer. And then over on the declarative side, there's more abstraction uh, away from that. Uh, but uh, imperative more closely re reflects the way computers work, and declarative more closely reflects the way that programmers think. So let's talk about the pros and cons. The pros of imperative programming are that it gives you more control and there's less, less abstraction from how the computer actually works. But with declarative programming, um, one huge pro is that you can much more easily develop for uh, multiple platforms. So in SwiftUI, for example, you can write code once and with very minimal changes, it will work for the watch, the iPhone, the iPad, the Apple TV, and native Mac apps, just as an example. Um, Flutter is a declarative framework that some people like for developing one app that can be used for both iOS and an Android. But just a side note, I've personally never seen a Flutter app that looks really good on iOS because developers tend not to put in the time into making the app work for all the different screen sizes. But I suspect that this will get better over time. Uh, I just really haven't seen it in my own experience so far. But if the developer is diligent, then they can make it work cross-platform just fine. Uh, another pro of declarative programming is that is there's usually a lot less code. It's more human readable um, and also more maintainable and scalable. Well, what about the cons? Uh, the cons of imperative programming is that you have to manually keep track of the state of values that you store in code. It's usually a lot more code, and it's harder to read and not as scalable. And uh, declarative programming, the cons are that it may be less flexible. Um, and uh, it, the frameworks tend to be a little bit more opinionated on how you should do certain things. So just some things to consider there. Here is an example of a simple interface that I just pulled from the web. Um, it's basically the same thing that we saw in our view example, with some bit of state being changed by the text field and some text that is referencing that state and then changing automatically. So if you were to do this um, using Apple's Swift language and their UI kit uh, framework to program this interface, you can see that it requires quite a bit of code to make that all work. 
But if you were to use a declarative framework like SwiftUI, then all you need to do is just declare uh, a few things, reference some state, and that's all you need. So let's do a demo of declarative programming just using SwiftUI. When you first create a new project, this is the boilerplate code that you are given. So you get a struct here, and that has uh, conforms to a specific type called view. And then it returns this body variable, uh, which uh, you define what sort of view uh, will be created um, by this struct. So you can only create one view at a time. Um, but I'll show you kind of how that works. So I can just update this text right here to, uh, let's say, my name is Gavin. And then you can see it updates over on the right. Um, and let's say we want to do exactly what we created in the view example. So if we want to create something in the view example, we need to create some sort of variable that will be our state. So we'll create var name equals, um, let's say, Gavitron, for example. So to make this variable a state, we just add this attribute here, this state attribute. And what this says is that anything that references this right here, if this variable changes, it will automatically change the views as well. So in this case here, I can uh, do some string interpolation and just put name right here and now it is referencing name so it'll update over here okay there you go and now what about changing this this state so to do that let's add a text field and I'm gonna add a text field here but you'll see that this will give me an error so text field I can uh, just put in some hint text right here enter your name and then the text what we'll do is we will bind this to name right here and you do that by using the dollar sign symbol so the dollar sign symbol just binds the variable to the input so when the input changes this will change but you can see I'm getting these errors and the reason why is because this view right here can only return one view so how do you do that well, you have to embed these two things inside of another view. There's all sorts of ways that you can do this. You can put it in a stack, in which case you can put it in a vertical stack where they'll be stacked vertically. Or you can put it in a horizontal stack where they'll be stacked horizontally. Or there are other types of views that you can embed these in as well. I'm just going to use what's called a vStack. So I just declare a vStack and I just wrap these two views inside of this one view and now you can see that uh, this text field is right here and then right below it is uh, the text view that we have so if I was to change this here then it's just changing automatically right here so that's how you uh, declare this state variable change the state and have text automatically update whenever that state is changed uh, just a few more things that I'd like to show you about SwiftUI. Um, you could embed these in something called a form. And what that will do is it will kind of format your views to look like this. So I can still kind of come in here and change these, just as an example. Um, but you can uh, embed this form in another vStack, just as an example. So I will embed this form in a vStack. OK. And then uh, what I can do is just have the text field be in the form. In this particular case, the form is taking up as much space as it wants. Um, and this other view here is only taking up a little bit. But if I want to, I can change that by adding modifiers. So in SwiftUI, you have this concept of modifiers where you can change different properties of the views. So for example, I could do foreground color, and then I could say color.pink, for example. Um, but I could also do something like dot frame, 
And uh, in this case, I don't care about width, so I don't need that parameter. I don't care about alignment, so I don't need that one. But for the height, I'll just say height 300. So now you can see it's going to be taking up that, um, that height that I told it to. So I can come down here, you know, and just change this to whatever I want, and it will just update here. So this is just a way of styling your app, a way of adding different properties to your app. And I encourage you, if you have uh, access to a Mac, to, to try this out and to play with some of these things because it's very quick and easy to create uh, your UIs. And then you can just kind of manage your state like this. So I'll be talking more about these in later lectures. But uh, this is just a quick overview of how SwiftUI is an example of declarative programming. Here's another example of SwiftUI. So over here, you have your UI shown on the right. And then you just have a vertical stack where these things are just vertically laid out. And you have an image. And this image here is pulling from the article.image. So here's this um, variable here that's just an article that kind of gets uh, pushed into these different views. And so here's your image. Here's some things to change the aspect ratio and corner radius, for example. Then you have a text view right here, which is the article.title. And then you have the author. And then here you have a horizontal stack. So this horizontal stack is embedded in this vertical stack. And it go, you can kind of define the spacing between elements within that horizontal stack. And then they're doing this for each here, where they're looking at the rating of the article and just laying out this star image right here four times, because it has a rating of four, for example. And then this excerpt right here um, could be just referring to this text right here, or it actually could be another view that is uh, showing this text, this line, and this image down here. So just an example of how you can lay things out in view declaratively. So questions that you should be able to answer for the final are things like, what's the difference between imperative and declarative programming? And what are the pros and cons of each? Um, and then also, uh, what is a conceptual model and how does it bridge the two goals? So, so that's more of what we covered in a previous lesson, but declarative programming is kind of an example of uh, conceptual models here. So that's it for this lesson, and we'll see you next time.